Hello and welcome once again to UCL Global Health. Water is arguably our most valuable resource, being essential for health, for agriculture, uh, for almost everything. And I'm joined by uh, Professor Richard Taylor, who's uh, our new Professor of Hydrogeology at UCL. Richard, you've done a lot of work, uh, well, all over the world, but particularly in Africa and East Africa, places like Uganda, Tanzania. What are the biggest problems that face those countries now and in the future from the point of view of water? Well, there's really two aspects of their water supply that uh, is a, uh, continues to be a major problem. And one of them, of course, relates to a uh, lack of access to safe water. And uh, so this is our improved water sources that are likely to be free of microbial contaminants or other things that would plague human health. Of course, diarrheal diseases remains a major killer um, uh, of uh, uh, children and infants. And so th there's a major problem with access to adequate quantities of safe water. The other thing is uh, uh, related to food security and actually productive livelihoods. So, and uh, this is water for irrigation. Yes, yes, it, it's uh, yes, exactly. Water for irrigation, water for uh, watering livestock, and really, when you think about it, it's for ensuring uh, 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 food supplies. But it's also for improving uh, in household incomes uh, as well, and, and more, you might say uh, developing economies themselves more generally, so that they are uh, more robust to not only uh, economic changes but also to climate change. Do we, do we have enough water overall or is it just in the wrong places or just not safe enough or is there an absolute shortage or will there be in the future? A common misper uh, misperception about uh, water in Africa is there isn't enough and actually really the problem in uh, many parts of Africa is one of distribution. Right. And so that, that really is uh, the problem. Distribution and then ultimately uh, developing it. And many, in many cases, for instance, um, I, I, my particular expertise lies in water underground, groundwater. And um, really, uh, the, the, uh, the magnitude of groundwater development at the moment is, is very low, but it has a huge potential to, um, to regulate water supplies in the sense that there's substantial storage of groundwater in the subsurface. So if it doesn't rain one season or the rains are lower than anticipated, it does mean that there will be sufficient quantities stored there to enable agricultural production. And in that part of the world, does the water table, is it steadily going down as population demand increases or is it replenished each year by the by the rains? No, in many cases it's, re it's replenished each year, so you do have a renewable water source that can be used. And one of the benefits of, of groundwater is that uh, it naturally stores water when it's in, a, in, in abundance, and then you can use it uh, later when there are times where water, uh, water is less. Um, aquifers are not as productive as they are in some places. We famously we hear of aquifers in, in, in India and places in China and the United States in particular, which is sustained food production and uh, people call it green revolutions that have taken place in those areas. Now the aquifers and the, uh, the ability to sustain agricultural water uh, uh, in the future is substantial but not, not on the same magnitude. So people have to think of it more as supplementary to rainfall rather than independent of rainfall. Now what say. about what, what about climate change. We're, let's assume we believe in climate change, that this is going to be an increasing problem, and let's say we're heading up for three plus degrees of warming this century. That's going to have effects on different parts of the world differently. You're going to get flooding and more rain in some areas, less in others. What's your kind of projection on what's going to happen, particularly in East Africa, which you know? Well, well, first of all, I do I do believe that climate change is impacting. I've uh, done more already. Work, yes, yes. I've uh, some of the work I've looked at uh, glaciers in the East African highlands, and they are rapidly deteriorating. And the ones in Uganda, uh, uh, on the border between Uganda and Congo, these are uh, uh, receding at a very rapid rate in relation in response directly in response to temperature rises. So global warming is not some sort of thing for the future. Global warming is happening in these and in more zone. more or less rainfall in future. Or is that well, it, it will vary substantially, but one of the key uh, aspects of a warmer world, or water in a warmer world, is it will rain less frequently, but when it does rain, it will rain more intensely. And there are strong kind of physical reasons behind that, uh, yeah. that, that procedure. But that actually is a mini blessing in, some, in that in an area, particularly let's say East Africa, where 
rates of evaporation and evapotranspiration are very high, it's actually these very short episodic uh, uh, surpluses of water when you have a heavy rain event that actually fundamentally determine the water resources of that region. So actually a shift to more intensive rainfall, or fewer but more intensive rainfalls, does mean that the risk of flooding will, uh, will, be, will increase. But it does mean there are opportunities there to try and tap and enhance and utilize that water. And this is where groundwater will particularly come into play because groundwater resources and groundwater is replenished during heavy rainfall events. And if so, we may be looking at a future where, in some environments anyway, groundwater resources are more substantial. And in particularly in areas where it rains less frequently, the soil moisture will be affected. This will affect crop production. So there will be a greater reliance on, on irrigation to sustain crops when it rains less frequently. Ah, well then that, that raises an interesting issue about uh, conflict between states. I mean, I, I was reading a couple of weeks ago that there's tension between, I think, Eritrea and Egypt about the Nile and that Eritrea were threatening to dam part of the Nile and it was going to affect Egypt. And in fact, I think the then president of Egypt, Morsi, threatened that they might take military action. I mean, is this, are we going to get water wars? Do you think that's a real scenario? Um, I don't think we're going to have water wars between states largely because we will find that in most cases, um, people, when people run short of water, they don't think to pick up a gun. Um, they no. usually think, how do, we, how do we solve this problem? And yeah. so states generally cooperate over water. Yes, there will be tension. What you may find is increasing conflicts over, for instance, individual sources between communities. There could be a wells or productive wells that some communities may favor or, or, or prefer. Yes, there has been a situation, and in this case, it's actually Ethiopia. Ethiopia is... is oh, it's her Ethiopia, yeah, not so, Eritrea. So, yeah, so Ethiopia is constructing dams and has plans to construct... It's constructing a dam at present, and there are further plans to construct more dams, which would impact the natural flow system of the uh, or of natural basin of the River Nile and this is something about which the Egyptians obviously take great have great concern about the the Ethiopians are planning to sustain the water resources but it may not have the same periodicity as as it had in the past because uh, greater water use will be taking yeah. place within Ethiopia there I, I, I don't anticipate water wars between states so much as greater perhaps skirmishes and conflicts among people right. within states right. And finally, you do your research, you come up with ideas about how to improve water management. Mm -hmm. How do you get that into practice? I mean, obviously you publish in journals, but how, yeah. how do you get it to those that really need that information? Well, I, I, I work directly with governments. It probably comes from the fact that I started out working with governments and, and with NGOs in the field. And uh, for me, there always had to be this role of how is my research going to be used? And secondly, it's all, it's a, all sorts is collaborative. So I'm working with people and communities in, the, in these areas, in, in rural Uganda, even urban Uganda, or in Tanzania as well. And so uh, the first thing also with any research is you should be looking to strengthen the capacity of the people you're working with. So in, if the research sort of doesn't come up with anything really, at least the capacity of people yeah. to continue that research is there. And so I make, I make uh, sure very, very much that my research is engaged with government because government ultimately are going to be the people who will um, help to uh, ensure that this research is implemented. Richard, many thanks. Yeah, thank you.